This video is sponsored by Deep Cut Studios. For a wide range of fantastic gaming resources such as battle mats, dice trays and pre-painted bases, check out the description below. Hi guys, welcome back to TNG Productions. My name is Tom and in this tabletop tutorial I'm going to show you how to play Malifaux, which is a steampunk skirmish game published by Weird Games. Now Malifaux is particularly famous for eschewing the traditional dice mechanic and replacing it with what is known as a fake deck which is almost like a standard poker deck where you take advantage of the jokers and the suits that come with in order to make sure that your attacks go through and you achieve what you want to achieve rather than just relying on a random dice roll. Now on top of that, Malifaux isn't just about butchering your opponents, it actually does require you to have schemes and strategies that you keep hidden until the most opportune moment and then you strike to score the victory points needed to win a game. Now everything that you need to play Malifaux is available for free for you to access, such as the rulebook and the excellent companion app that goes with it. I will put links in the description for anything that I think will be useful for new players, but this video is designed to be an accompaniment to that rulebook, so if you've got it on hand that will be really useful, but this is for those who visually want to see how the game plays out. Now if you enjoy this and you get the grasp of these rules, then you can then move on to our battle reports that we do for Malifaux, which are beginner friendly, but take into account basic knowledge of these rules. Hopefully this will be a nice step up on your journey. So without further ado, let's get to the table. And here we are with the crews for today's demo game. And you can see on the left hand side, we've got the guild faction represented by Perdita Ortega and her family keyword. And on the right hand side, we have the outcasts that are led by Victoria Chambers leading her mercenary keyword. And yeah, hiring factions in Malifaux is pretty straightforward once you've got the knack for the basics. And the main thing I can recommend for this is to use the app. It has both like a tablet and phone version and a desktop version, it's completely free. And you can play around looking at all the cards, looking at the costs of models and work it out from there. But the short version is, essentially you start with a leader. So for example, Perdita here, they usually come with a totem and those models are free. And then you build a crew using either the keyword or models from the faction. It's usually a bit cheaper to hire from your own keyword and usually a bit more synergist. But if you want to go outside of your keyword and stay within your faction, you can. Now most Malifaux games are about 50 soul stones and you spend your soul stones to pay for characters and any that you have left over you can use for particular in-game effects that I'll be showing you. Both of these crews sit at about 20 soul stones but I've left them to go up to about 23 so they have three each to demonstrate their abilities but this is a small crew that's designed for a quick demo game. Now, as you might see, the aesthetic for these two crews is very kind of steampunky Wild West, but rest assured, if you've got different tastes, there are things like, you know, sentient teddy bears, giant Cthulhu monsters, there are gremlins and goblins, there are steam-powered arachnids. There'll definitely be something that can take your fancy, but these guys are particularly good as a demo game because they excel at the base mechanics. Now, there's one interesting thing to note. As you noticed here, Perdita is the leader, and she has her Nephilim as her totem, but the Victoria's actually break that convention. They have two master level models. Now a master is usually your leader, so we're gonna designate this crouching Victoria as the leader of this crew. But the other models within these crews fall under different brackets. You can have henchmen, which I'm not including in this demo, who are very strong second in command characters. You can have enforcers that are specific named characters that you can have one of, or you can have minions. Now the really cool thing about Malifaux is minions you can have more than one of, but they're not just rank and file troops. They might have the same profile, but they actually come with different sculpts, such as our two Ronin on this outcast faction here. But I'll talk you through how these guys function on the table, so let's go get set up. And here we are then all set up, and you can see Perdita and her guild on the left-hand side and the Vix and the Outcast on the right-hand side. Now, Malifaux is an alternate activation game, meaning that you have one side go, then the other side, and take it in turns until you've completed all of your activations. It's usually played on a 3x3 three three board, as you can see here, and it usually goes to five turns. Now, that is going to be way more than we need for today's video, so I'm just going to be sticking with three just to show you the main mechanics. Now, each player goes five turns because they are trying to secure VP or victory points. And there are a total of eight available for each player for the game. Now, the first half of those VP are through something called a strategy. Now, strategy is an open objective both players have to try and score. And they can score those strategies once per turn on the second turn onwards. So what I mean by that is no points are scored turn one. You can score on turns two, three, four and five, meaning there are four points available for it. Now, these strategies can be things like kill a member of the opposing team, 
grab a specific marker, get to a specific position, move a specific item around. And they change each season of gaining grounds that come out from weird games, which kind of keep it fresh and alive and kind of act as almost like an errata, just in case any crews are particularly strong. Now, the strategy we're going to be using today is super simple. It's going to be called Place Your Markers. And each crew is going to be trying to put down their scheme markers over the halfway line. Now, I'm not going to bother with turn one because essentially it's a lot of movement and positioning and no one can score. So we're going to imagine, as you can see, I've moved models a little bit out of their deployment. We're going to imagine that we're jumping in straight in turn two, meaning that the game is live. They can score points straight away. Now, while I'm mentioning deployment, you can see there's a variety of lines that are on this board here. And because deployment in Malfoy is very varied, and I'll leave you to look at the rule book for that for simple information, but essentially you can deploy in corners, in a wedge formation, like a spearhead, and it has a great deal of variety to your game types. And obviously some masters prefer some types of deployment. Now, the second way that you can score points, i.e. the other four that are available in traditional games, are something called schemes. Now, there's a big pool of schemes that are available, and for each game of Malifaux you play, you will generate a pool of five schemes to choose from, and each player will secretly select two. Now, each scheme comes with a reveal point and an end of game point. And what I mean by that is no one knows what they've got at the start, but when you reveal it, if you've successfully secured it, you'll gain a point. And then if you've done the second part of that scheme, you'll get the second one. And the one we're going to use today is the most straightforward. It's called Assassinate. Now, Assassinate, you will gain a point if you get the opposing master leader to half wound. So obviously that'll be Perdita and the Ponytail Victoria here. And that will be something that you can reveal. Now, we're only going to be using the one today. We're not going to be using two, and we're definitely not going to be using a pool of five. But you can imagine kind of faking out the opponent of which schemes you've taken is a good way to try and oppose them, you know, counteracting it. The second part of Assassinate that you can score, which will be at the end of the game, is if you've killed the opposing master. So you can get one point for locking them down to half health. Doesn't matter if they heal up afterwards. If at the end of the turn they've got half health, you get the point. And you get the second point if you've killed the opposing leader as well. So that's going to be the only scheme that we go for. But by all means, consolidate our battle reports if you want to have a look at the kind of full pools and how that can be used. So that's all the base information down. We're pretty much ready to go. So we're going to go to the start phase. OK, and here we are then for the start phase. And the start phase is really straightforward in Malifaux. Essentially, each player draws what we call a control hand of cards. And this is usually six cards, but for today's demo, we're just going to be using four. And these cards are going to be a hand that each character can use to kind of cheat fate or change their look if their decks go against them. The second thing that we need to do is we also need to calculate something called pass tokens. Now, these are little tokens that look like this that are designed to stop one player steamrolling the other in terms of activations. So if a player has less models than the opposing side, they gain a pass token. And that means that when their activation comes around, they can spend the pass token just to skip it. And that's to stop someone from always getting the last turn. There are even some crews who take advantage of it as a mechanic. So if you are two characters down, you get two pass tokens. If you are three characters down, you get three and onwards and upwards. But nice and easy, we've got five for each side, so I don't have to worry about that for this first turn. Finally, we do something called an initiative flip, and this is where both players flip a card to see who goes first. Now, if they flip the card and they don't like it, they can cheat in a card from their control hand, but I'm just going to flip from the top and see how we do. So Perdita and the Guild, they flip a 12, ooh, high card to start with, and the Victorias flip a 10. So the Guild have the opportunity to decide who goes first or second. I think Perdita's going to go first. She's going to take the initiative with her crew. And then the outcast will be going second and we'll go into alternate activations as we start this demo. OK, here we are then. So let's show you the base mechanics of this game. So what better to show you than, you know, moving and attacking? Because that's what everyone wants to know straight away. And we're going to use the beautiful Abuela Ortega, the angry granny with the sawn off shotgun to demonstrate this. Now, Malifaux models in general have two action points. And then there's something called a quick action available to them, which you'll see, which is a lightning bolt that appears on their cards. The only exception to this are masters who have three action points and this quick action, this bonus action on top, because obviously their main event, they're a little bit better. So Abuela definitely isn't the leader of our crew like Perdita. So Abuela has got two action points and her quick action available. Now, where to find that on the cards? Well, the front of your card tends to have your general statistics and information about your character. So you've got their base statistics, such as their defense, their willpower, their movement speed, and their size. 
their wounds and something called abilities, which kind of give their personality and feel. Now, this stuff is always on. So this tends to be the face of the card that you have up facing you most of the time until they choose to activate and then you flip it over and you use this side. And you can see Abuela's card is split into two subheadings, attack actions and tactical actions. You can see that lightning symbol there showing that this is a quick or bonus action that she can use for free. Now, an attack action is usually something that your opponent will resist. A tactical action is usually something you do for yourself that you don't have to worry about resisting for. So let's start with the basics. Abuela is going to take a walk action, the foundation of any skirmish game. And Abuela is just going to move her four inches to this position here. Now, there are a variety of different move actions in Malifaux. The walk specifically tends to be something you do in your activation. And you can't do it if you're being engaged by the opponent, which we'll explain a little bit later. But there are other kind of movement mechanics like pushes or moves as they're called as well on top. And they tend to be things that you tell other models to do. But for now, walk, just move your inches nice and easy. The next thing we're gonna do is probably the most complex part of this tutorial. If you nail this and you see me repeat it a couple of times, you'll have the rest of this down pat. So we are going to try and attack. And this is gonna cause something called an opposed duel. Because Abuela is gonna fire her sawn off shotgun at Victoria Chambers, Vix number two, who's jumping in the air there. You can see, she can probably already see the shotgun shell coming her way. So this is a type of attack action. There are three types. You've got a melee action, which is a claw symbol. You can see Abuela's got sharp wit for hers. There's a ranged attack, which is usually a shooting action, which you can see Abuela's got for her sawn off shotgun. And there are also attacks that don't have a profile symbol next to them, meaning they can be done in close range and far range. You don't need to worry about any additional rules. Now, for shooting actions or ranged actions, there are some limitations. If Abuela was engaged by an enemy, she wouldn't be able to shoot someone else or shoot in general, actually. If there were terrain in the way, that would also be a problem. But we're going to come on to that a little bit later. Let's start with the basic card mechanics. So first of all, we range up and you can see that Abuela's sword off shotgun has got six inches next to the gun symbol, meaning she can shoot up to six inches away. So she's perfectly in range. She then needs to make sure she's got line of sight to her target, and you measure that with straight lines from board, uh, model edge to model edge. We check to see if there's anything of any particular height in the way. So both of these models are what we call height two. There's no big terrain in the way to block line of sight. There's no other models in the way. So we're just gonna go straight up with the next part, which is Abuela statistic. So you can see six inch range, stat five, and you've got wrist resist by defense. This means that Abuela is gonna flip a card in a minute and she is gonna add her stat of five to it. And Victoria will oppose this by flipping a card and adding her defensive stat to it, which is a six. Victoria's got pretty damn good defense that she has available to her. So let's get to it then. So Abuela is going to flip a card from her fate deck. She flips a nine, that's not bad at all. So that brings her total currently with her stat five up to 14. Victoria Chambers, she flips a oh, two. That, that's not as good, is it really? Uh, leaving her on a total of eight at the moment. Abuela is winning. Now, at this point, both characters could choose to cheat in a card from their hand. So for reference, Abuela has drawn these cards for this turn, or the guild have available to each of their models. And if there's an opposed duel, you usually can cheat unless you're at something called a negative flip, and I'll explain what that means in a second. We'll come on to cheating in a moment, but we'll go with these statistics and we'll see how we do. So Abuela, final total of 14. Victoria, final total of eight. So Abuela has been successful with her attack. So we now need to decide how we're gonna do damage. And this is basically done with something called an accuracy modifier. And this is the complex bit that I was on about. Essentially, the difference between your final dual totals denotes how accurate the attack is. If you both end up on the exact same total, then the attack will not be very accurate, meaning you will actually flip multiple cards and pick the lowest result for damage. And we call this a negative flip. If it's actually matched, we call it a double negative flip because essentially you flip three cards and you pick the lowest. If there is the difference of one to five between your dual totals, it's a negative flip. You flip two cards and you choose the lowest. If there's a difference between six and 10, which there is difference of six here, you just flip a card, it's a straight flip, and you are good with that. And you are able to cheat in a stronger card from your hand if you want to. And if you absolutely hammer them, let's say if there's a difference of 10 or more, you actually get a positive flip where you flip two cards and pick the highest instead. Now, like I said, this is a fair bit of information and you'll just see this repeated through the tutorial and it'll start to make sense. But the short version of this, Abuela has beaten Victoria by six, adding a stat of five to nine compared to Victoria's stat of six and to her two. 
So 14 to 8, difference of 6. So Abuela is just going to flip one card from the deck and see what she gets. And she flips a 4. Now this isn't 4 damage. Actually, the symbol we need to pay attention to here is the little pip that comes underneath. Now depending on the fake deck you've got, the beginner's ones tend to have really nice clear symbol like weak here. Other ones tend to have these little pips. Now, on Abuela's shotgun profile, you can see underneath where it says the name of it, it says target suffers two slash three slash four damage. A single pip, i.e. a one to five, is a weak card. That would be the first profile. A double pip or a six till 10 would be a moderate damage. That would be the second profile. Or a 11 plus three pips would be a severe damage. That would be the third profile. So Abuela's first one says target suffers two damage. So Victoria Chambers will take two wounds. She will go down to six. Now Abuela, because she's not on any negative, she could have cheated that result from something from her hand. But we'll come on to cheating in a moment. But for now, two damage on one of those masters. Well, if a granny shooting your sister in the face isn't a wake-up call, I don't know what is. So we're going to go with Vanessa Chambers of the Outcast now. Now, the Outcast have drawn a relatively decent hand here. You can see for their cards. And what I just showed you a second ago was what we call a opposed duel. Let's go with a simple duel now, which is basically where you flip a card for yourself and you're aiming to get a certain result. So let's do the basics again. Vanessa is going to move a grand total of five inches, according to her move stat. We're not going to worry about any bonus or quick actions for this one. She has got one, but it's usually used for people who are in close combat. So we're going to go straight to her second action point, which is going to be using a tactical action called Healing Energy. Now, Healing Energy, very similar to Abuela's, has a range, which is eight inches. She's going to be literally targeting a big sis here, so definitely within range. It has a stat of six. Now, rather than having a resist, it has a TN, a target number, meaning that when you flip, your grand total must hit this target number, either match it or beat it. So stat six, needing a target number of 12. So she needs to flip here a six or more. Let's see what she is able to flip. We flip a seven, perfect. So that healing energy has successfully gone off. Now, on simple duels, you do not have to worry about an accuracy modifier. So you can just do what we call a straight flip, which can be cheated. So you can see the target will heal one slash two slash three. So we're gonna flip a card and see what it is to try and heal big sis. We flip and we get a week of a four. So the week would mean that Vanessa has healed Victoria one HP. Do you know, I think we can do better than that. So this is where we're gonna start using our hand of cards. I'm gonna cheat this seven that I drew to replace that four with a moderate. So instead of the one, we heal this Victoria two HP using that healing energy. Now the eagle eyed of you might have seen that there is a book symbol and the words healing burst underneath. Now that is something called a trigger. Do not worry, I will come on to that when we go on to turn two. But for now, Big Sis is all patched up. Okay, so I literally turn around for two seconds and Papa Loco has managed to set himself on fire. I don't know how, but it, it's a handy opportunity. We're going to use this as a learning opportunity. So another thing that you are able to do in this game as a general action is something called assist. And this is really valuable because there are a variety of status conditions that exist in the game, such as poison, burning, staggered, stunned. Some of these do damage to you. Some of them build up. Some of them tick down. Some of them go away when you activate. But, you know, the guy with the dynamite being on fire is not great. So I'm going to rely on my little totem here, the enslaved Nephilim, and he's going to use an ability called assist. Now assist basically targets a friendly model that is within two inches, another friendly model, and line of sight, got to be able to see him. And we flip a card and we can lower the value of burning, distracted or injured by one, two or three. So it's like a normal kind of flip that we just did for Vanessa. So let's flip a card and see if we can deal with this. We flip a two pip moderate good, so we can reduce the burning by two. He's only got one on him, that's the crisis averted. You, you just go back to facing them. Stop setting yourself on fire, you idiot. Right, let's go on to a quick action, a bonus action then. So this enslaved Nephilim is cool. It's really thematic, these uh, quick actions, these bonus actions as well. He's basically a demon that Perdita has kind of clipped the wings of and kept hold of, but he's still pretty ugly and scary. So his tactical action is called Frightening Reminder. It's just going to remind her of the time, you know, when he was born free and not in captivity. Uh, it's very similar to Vanessa's kind of healing action. So... It's a range of six, stat of five, target number of 10. And you can see underneath it has some words that are in italics. Now this can often be the cost that you need to pay or a specific rule according to this. And you can see it says other friendly model only. So you can't frighteningly remind himself, obviously. Push the target up to four inches away from this model. So 
Stat of five, needing a 10, so we need at least a five when we flip it. That's what we get. We get a 10, super successful, lovely. Now, a push is something that happens in a straight line directly away or towards, depending on what it says. This one says, push the target up to four inches away. We're gonna go the full four inches. Now, what makes a push different from the walk actions that we've been taking? A walk action can be broken into small segments. You can bend your walk, you can do whatever you want. A push has to be in a straight line and has to be directly from the center of each model away or towards, depending on what it says. So if Perdita were to hit something like another model or some terrain, she would actually stop here. Whereas a move or a walk, you would go around it. But for now, Super Scary Nephilim has done its job. Now that just leaves it a little bit of a mosey that it's gonna do itself. It has a four inch move. I, I think it probably needs to keep an eye on Papaloco, doesn't it? So it's just gonna move itself around the back here and just make sure that Papaloco doesn't do anything too loco. Too much to ask. Okay, let's show you a master activation then because they get three actions to take. We're gonna go with our Victoria leader here. It's gonna show you how close combat works. So this Victoria has a move of six inches and this is where melee reach is gonna be important. So if we go to the back of her card, you can see that she's got some enchanted katanas that she can attack with, which have a listed range of one inch. Now, if we measure here, even if she moves, because obviously she's gonna go for Perdita, she wants that assassinate point, she's not quite within range to swing at her. So what Victoria is gonna do instead, for her first action, she is going to move into a position where she can get stuck into Perdita. I'm gonna show you what a charge action does in a second, but to begin with, her second action is going to be to take the Concentrate action. And Concentrate gives you the Focus condition, and this is an awesome condition. It's one you'll see a lot of players use in Malfoy. Focus basically gives you a positive flip to the jewel that you want to use it on. So it can be defensive or attacking. If you use it for attacking, you also get a positive on the damage flip, which can be really useful, so it adds a plus. And positive and negative flips cancel each other out. So if Victoria gets a negative flip here, and the positive goes through from the focus, she can kind of nullify them. So we'll see what happens as we flip. So she's gonna declare what we call a charge. Now a charge is a push up to your movement in inches, followed by a close combat attack, and that all counts as one action. So you can't bend around things, obviously you have to go in a straight line, but Victoria is basically gonna charge to anywhere within an inch, so she's gonna to go to there, into Perdita. And she's gonna spend her focus, because I'm gonna show you exactly how this works with this positive flip. So. Let's go with Victoria first. She's gonna flip a oh, one with her katana and then a 10, that's a lot better. Perdita is resisting this stat seven attack with her defense of six. She flips a oh, five. So Perdita's not great at the moment. She's on a total of 11. Victoria's on a total of 17. So you can see that focus really helped flipping two cards, otherwise she would have been losing this duel. Now, I think now is probably a good time for Perdita to potentially cheat in a card here. So Perdita is gonna cheat in an 11. Now, whoever is losing the duel cheats first. So Victoria could, so Perdita's gone up to 17 now to match Victoria. Victoria could cheat in her own 11 here now that she's seen what Perdita's going to do, but I think that's gonna be okay for now. We're gonna let it slide because we've got what we call a double negative flip here because the accuracy modifier is the difference of zero between their two results. So this ordinarily would lead us to flip three cards and pick the lowest for Victoria on her damage track of three, four, and six. But because we used a focus, our damage also gets a positive added to it. So rather than it being a double negative, it's just a single negative. Hopefully this is making sense. So Victoria is gonna flip two cards and pick the lowest. So let's see what damage she flips. She flips a severe, that's looking good, and a moderate, that's not bad at all. So Victoria has got a moderate stat of four damage. So because it's a negative, we have to pick the lowest. We can't cheat anything here on a negative flip. But four damage on Perdita is really tasty. It knocks her from 12 all the way down to eight, and I think that's a pretty strong attack. So no bonus actions for Victoria, but that's showing you how charging and focus works. So this has been a sensible move from the Victoria to try and tie up the gunslingers in this crew because, as we've said, for this, if you're tied up in close combat, you can't ordinarily shoot. Now, when we come on to the next turn, we'll show you how the Ortegas can get around this. But we're going to go with Santiago here, and he's going to try and deal with the imminent problem because this is leader on leader action, so if we can get some damage off, it'll help. So he's going to move. He's got a move of five inches. He's not going to go that far. He's just going to go straight in front of the Nephilim here. And he is going to try and blast a shot into that Victoria with his custom Peacebringer, which has a 12-inch range and a stat of six, resisted by Victoria's defense of a six. 
However, he is shooting into close combat, which is a bit of a problem because he might accidentally shoot a friend. So he has to be really careful with his shot. And this is represented by something called the friendly fire rule in Malifaux. Really simple. If you are shooting into combat, you gain a negative flip to your duel. Meaning Santiago is going to be flipping two cards and picking the lowest versus Victoria just flipping the one on her defense. So let's go with Santiago then. Stat six, he flips a... Eight, that's not too bad. And oh, a two. So the two will replace the eight. So his total is currently eight in general with his staff six. Victoria has got a defense of six. Let's see what she flips. She flips a three. It's not great, but it takes her up to nine. Now, this is a problem for Santiago because he does have better cards in his hand that he could cheat in to get one up on Victoria as he's currently losing. But you cannot cheat negative flips, meaning that Santiago's total of eight will just stay that way and he will just have to cut his losses and not be able to help his big sis there by blasting away. That being said, Santiago does have other means that is disposable. He is disposable, disposal. He's a man of many talents. So he's gonna use his bonus action called I've Got Your Back. Now he targets a friendly model, as you can see, an other engaged friendly model is the cost of this. Within six inches, which we are just about with it, and it says the target is, uh, is placed into base contact with this model. So this is a different type of movement mechanic. This is placing where you can just basically pick a model up and put it down within range. So it has a stat of six and it has a target number of 10, meaning Santiago will need a four here. Let's hope he flips better. He flips a seven, that is good stuff. So he has targeted Perdita. He can pick her up and pay, place her, I'm sorry, struggling with that word today, place her into base contacts. So they're just going to go back to back because that's totally badass in their leather gear. And that Santiago done. Couldn't shoot the Vic, but he's managed to pull Perdita out. Maybe other people can now blast out Victoria and now she's not in combat. So we've seen a fair bit of bloodshed so far. So let's go actually score some kind of strategy points because, you know, there's points to be scored. We need to put markers down over this halfway line. And the Ronin has remembered to do this. So she's going to step up. The Ronin has got a move of five inches. She's not going to go the full five inches. I think she's going to walk to here. And she's going to take what is called the interact action. Now, the interact action is kind of your catch-all phrase for doing some of these strategy requirements. So any model in the game that is significant, i.e. doesn't have the insignificant rule, basically, can interact to put down a scheme marker. Now, markers are usually 30 millimeter tokens that you can usually walk on unless they have different rules. So you can get different traps and things that are a little bit bigger, or you can even put down like ice pillars, some of the characters, which are absolutely amazing. The interact action is quite cool. The fact that you can put down these markers or you can interact diffusing bombs and things like that, depending on what you're required to do. But it does have some limits. You cannot interact when you are engaged, unless you have a special rule that allows you to. And you cannot interact if you have disengaged that turn. That means kind of ran away from an enemy model, which I'll show you in a moment. But the Ronin didn't have to worry about this. She just skulks over the halfway line and she puts down that token, hoping to score her side a point this turn. Now it's worth saying interact isn't always just to put down markers and score straps. You can also take the interact action to remove all markers that are in base contact. So if Abuela would have gone a little bit later, she could have potentially moseyed on maybe shot or pushed the road out of the way and then picked up that marker, but too little too late now. Okay then, seeing as he's not set himself on fire this turn, let's go with Papaloco. He's gonna show you a different type of range attack called a shockwave. So Papaloco doesn't shoot you, he throws dynamite at you, because of course he does. He's gonna use his throw dynamite ability, which is a ranged attack. So again, he has to make sure he's not engaged. It's got an eight inch range and it's got a stat of six. Now, rather than being resisted, you can see it's got a TN, it's got a target number of 12. And underneath it says shockwave two, move 13, damage three. So I'll show you how this works. He's got an eight inch range for this attack and he puts down a shockwave mark and he's gonna go for the leader because obviously we want those points. He's gonna chuck his shockwave, let's chuck it here. So it has to be within line of sight and has to be within the range, that definitely is. He's then got to see if he can match that target number test. So stat six needing a 12, so we want at least a six here. Let's see what he flips, he flips. Oh, Loco, you no good, he flips a two. Um, let's cheat one of our cards from our hands. So in our hand, we've got a three, a five, and an eight. Let's cheat that eight in to make sure that it is successful. So this has been a successful attack, which is really good, but rather than having a damage profile, rather than having a accuracy modifier, for want of a better word, we actually follow what the shockwave says. So it says shockwave, 
2, which basically means that any models that are within 2 inches of this shockwave, which luckily is just this Victoria, then have to take a dual. So it says move 13, otherwise they will take 3 damage. So the Victoria is going to have to take a movement dual. Now if you remember, she is a movement of 6, so she is going to see if she is able to beat this dual total. She flips an eight, so her move of six added to the eight definitely beats that 13. That would be the target number for that, so she does not sustain any damage. Shockwaves are a really good way of hitting a big group of enemies and forcing your opponent to maybe cheat in cars to protect them, and you'll see some crews take advantage. It's a specific type of attack that we call it a pulse, which is basically an area damage that goes off and is then gone. The alternative version is an aura, and an aura is always on. And you can see pulses and auras that are shown with different symbols on the cards. A pulse is usually a person with a hobbled out circle, an aura is a coloured in one, and we'll show you some of those in turn two. But for now, his shockwave has gone off, the dynamite has gone, let's just presume the Vic has done an amazing combat roll to get out of the way. So, Loco is quite frustrated with that, as, as you can expect. So he is going to barrel in now to combat. Now he's not going to go into the Vic, he's going to decide to go and deal with this Ronin over here. So he's going to declare a charge. Uh, Papa Loco has a move of 5 inches, so he can push up to 5 inches, and he's got a 0 inch range on his frantic flaming, so he's got to get into base to base contact. And he is conveniently just within 5 inches, so he's going to charge this Ronin and get stuck into combat. So Frantic Flailing is a stat of five. It has an inbuilt RAM, but we'll talk about that from turn two onwards. So for now, it's just stat five and it is resisted by the Ronin's defense, who's also on a five. So let's see how they do. Papaloco flips a three and the Ronin flips a, oh, a two. So at the moment, the Ronin is on seven and Papaloco is on eight, meaning that the Ronin would be the one who can cheat first if she wants to. And I think she is. She's going to cheat in that nine from her hand to go up to 14. And this is where your control hand is really important because Papaloco is only left with a three and a five, meaning that he is unable to try and out cheat her. So his attack action fails, i.e. nothing happens here. Disappointing for the crazy man. So yeah, being in close combat with the crazy man is definitely not where the Ronin wants to be. Now, she can't just walk away because she's been engaged by him. So she's going to do something called the disengage action. Now, disengage is an ability to kind of get yourself out of trouble. So one enemy that's targeting you may take a close combat attack against you. So Papaloco is going to use the same attack he did before, stat five versus the Ronin's defense. You can't declare triggers on this, which is something I'll talk about in turn two. But essentially, if the defending model is successful, the Ronin, it can push up to its move in inches away. If the attacking model is successful, you still do the same positive and negative flip modifiers, but rather than doing damage, you reduce that push by two, four, or six inches, depending on if it's moderate, severe, or weak. So we'll see how they do. So as we said, Papaloco is stat five versus the Ronin's defense of five. The Ronin flips a 10, not bad, so a total of 15. Papaloco flips ah, a one, pathetic. And as we've seen, he's not got anything in his hand to cheat. So the Ronin has been victorious here and is able to push her move away from Papaloco. But let's say she would have lost that. Again, we would have used the accuracy modifier. Papaloco would have flipped as if he was doing damage, but his moderate, weak, severe would have been two, four, six inches reduced. So actually, if she only had a move of five, which she does, and he managed to flip a severe on it, she wouldn't actually be able to push away. But she's been very lucky so for now. Now, she's more concerned with, again, being charged by Papaloco. So I think for a second action, she's simply just going to walk herself behind these barrels here and get an appraisal of the situation. Right, time for the Guildmaster to step up to the plate. Perdita Ortega. She is deadly with her custom peace bringer. So she's going to go straight away. And she's going to start shooting. So her custom peace bringer is a 12 inch range, is a stat seven, it's resisted by people's defense. So she is going to target the Ronin that's just selfishly ran away from Papa Loco. So well within range, and she's going to declare an attack. However, this is where cover is going to come into play because the Ronin quite sensibly hid behind some barrels. So, solid objects within Malifaux have a height value. So these barrels are height one because they're about half the height of a person. This would be height two. And we've got some big features like this rock over here that'd be kind of height three or four. 
And these items cast a shadow. And a shadow basically means if a line of sight passes through the cover and a model is within the distance of the cover's height, so for these barrels you'd have to be within an inch, if it was this building you'd have to be within three, then you gain a cover bonus. And essentially the way cover works is it gives you plus one to your defense against range attacks and it puts a negative on any damage flips against it. So Perdita will be attacking with a stat seven, the Ronin's defense will go up from five to six. Let's see how Perdita does. So Perdita flips and she gets, oof, a 12, takes her to 19. That's really tasty. And the Ronin gets an eight. So with her defense of five to six, takes it to 14. So we've got 19 to 14. That is a difference of five. So that would be imposing a negative flip on Perdita. The Ronin could cheat in an 11 here, but I think the negative should help her out. So. Perdita is going to do her negative flips. This would usually be two cards and then picking the lowest. However, because the Ronin is in cover, that adds another negative to the flip, meaning we're going to flip three cards and pick the lowest. Let's see how Perdita does. She gets a severe, a weak, and a severe, oh, almost. So she's going to have to choose that weak there. And Perdita's weak damage is two. So the Ronin goes from six health down to four, which isn't too bad, but it could have been so much better. So Perdita instead is gonna maybe turn her attention to, I don't know, maybe the Vic. Let's see if we can get some damage on her. So she's just gonna like pivot. You can freely rotate your models for dramatic effect. And she's gonna attack the Victoria. So there's nothing blocking line of sights here. Even though she is within two inches of this crate, the line of sight does not go through. So she doesn't benefit from cover for it, which is an important aspect. So Petita's gonna fire a shot. So this is gonna be stat seven versus the Victoria's defense of six. Let's see if this is any better. Victoria gets a... Ooh, a 12, that's a very, very strong card. Perdita gets, ooh, I wonder when these were gonna turn up. Red Joker, right, so there are two Jokers in the deck. There's a Red Joker and a Black Joker. And the Red Joker counts as a 14 when you are flipping. So it is a brilliant card to flip. And it supersedes every card other than the Black Joker. Even if you flip the Red Joker during a negative flip, the Red Joker takes precedence. And if you flip it for damage, it counts as severe plus one. And again, will supersede any other cards in negative other than the Black Joker. So it's a really good one to flip. So that takes Perdita up to 21. And as you can see by the symbols down the side, the Red Joker can also count as any suit of your choice, which will be important when we come on to triggers next turn. So 21 versus Victoria's 18 with her defense of six. So it's still gonna be a negative flip, but it's just as well Perdita flipped well. So on this negative flip, Perdita gets a weak and a moderate. So again, it's gonna be two damage. So Victoria Chambers goes from eight down to six health, and that's not too bad for now. Now Perdita could ride her luck and try and take a third shot here. I think she's just going to start getting herself into a better position for next turn. So I think she's going to take a leaf out of the Ronin's book and just move to here so she can survey the battlefield and get a good lay of the land. Okay, on to the last activation of the turn then. I think Victoria's going to get a bit of revenge on Abuela. You know, she got a shotgun shell to the face for the first activation. I think it's only fair that, you know, a sword is returned. So Victoria is going to take the concentrate action to gain a point of focus. And then she is going to charge into Abuela using her enchanted katana. So remember, we push up to our move. We're well within range. And we're going to get stuck in. So Victoria is going to drop her focus to get a positive flip to this. And this is a stat seven on her katana versus Abuela's measly defense of a four. So we'll let Abuela set the pace. She flips a four. Well, that's an eight. I don't think this is going to be good enough, but we'll see what happens here. Victoria flips an 11 and a 12. So Victoria gets to pick the highest card because of her focus. So that is a total of what, 19? compared to Abuela's total of an eight. Yeah, I think this is gonna be painful. So Victoria has actually earned what's caused a positive flip here because the difference is more than 10. She can actually flip two cards and then choose the highest, but because she focused, she gets not only a positive to her uh, her initial flip or opposed flip, she also gets a positive to her damage flip. So she's gonna be on a double positive flip. We've seen so many negatives. It's about time we had some positives. It's the, the 2021 way. So. Victoria is going to flip three cards and pick the highest. So she gets a moderate, oh, they always come in pairs, a black joker, 
And a severe. Oh, now, you would have thought that would usually be good news. The severe is great. That could be a mighty six damage. But the Black Joker takes precedence over everything. And you can always tell that when you flip the red, the black is not too far behind. The Black Joker then, ladies and gentlemen, if you flip it for an opposed duel, it is worth zero. If you flip it for a damage flip, it is worth zero. It sucks. It's the worst of the cards. And it supersedes every other card during every other duel total, even including the Red Joker. So that does zero damage. Zero damage, Victoria. Zero damage. Right, do you know what? Let's give her one more go, because she's got a third AP. She is a master. She might as well just beat the Living Daylights up as well. So we're going to go again with our last action. So... Again, stat seven, this is just gonna be a straight flip now. We've got nothing else that we can go with. So Abuela flips a 12, that's quite tasty. And Victoria flips, ooh, a six. So Abuela is on a total of 16, while Victoria is on mental maths, Tom, about what, 12-ish? Um, 13 with her stat of seven. So Victoria's gonna to need to cheat here, I think. And she is, she's gonna cheat in that 11 that we've been keeping hold of to go to an 18. So 16 to 18, difference of two. This will be a negative flip for the Victoria's damage. So we're gonna flip two cards and pick the lowest, but we know it's not the Black Joker, which is good. So let's see what it is. So we get a severe and a moderate. So the negative flip means we have to choose the lowest one, which is the moderate damage. So Victoria, that's four damage, which knocks a boiler from five all the way down to one health, which is putting her in a lot of peril as we bring an end to this first turn. And so with the activation phase all done, that brings us to the end phase of this first turn. And usually this would be where we could resolve any effects or statuses that would finish at the end of the turn. We've got nothing that actually we need to worry about here. So we can go straight to the next part, which is scoring VP. So with our strategy of putting down our scheme markers, we can see that that Ronin has been able to secure the Victoria's one victory point. Now, both leaders of the crews, the Ponytail Vix and Perdita, are above their half health, so we're not seeing any assassinate yet. But one or two more hits, and those guys could definitely secure those points for that turn. So currently, it's 1-0 in favour of the Outcasts. Now, the last thing we need to do in the end phase is we need to take our discard piles and our remaining fake deck and shuffle them together. So I'm gonna give those a shuffle off camera and then we'll draw our new hands, which I'll explain for start phase of turn two. And here we are then for the start phase of turn two. And now for this turn, I'm gonna show you three new major mechanics. We're gonna look at the use of soul stones that you might remember from the start. We're gonna look at the use of abilities, which are the skills that are on the front of player cards. And we're going to use triggers, which is perhaps the most kind of flavorful part of attack actions. So to start with, in the start phase, we discard any cards that we have remaining in our hand that we don't want to keep. So for example, we have Perdita's group. They have this five and this three. That's not going to do them much good. So they're going to discard that. Now, if you had a 13 or something left, you could keep hold of it. And then what you do is you draw cards back up to your maximum total for your control hand. So remember, normally that would be six cards, but today we're going to do four. So let's just do Perdita's. She has managed to draw these four cards. Black Joker, so it's good to have that in our hands. We know we can't flip it. A three, a one, and a six. Now they're quite low cards. So one thing that you can do with your soul stones, the first thing I'm going to show you, is when you draw your cards in the start phase, you may spend a soul stone to draw an additional two more cards, and then you must always discard back down to your control hand. So Perdita is going to draw a 12 and a four, which gives her a slightly better looking control hand of this. Obviously, we need to discard cards, so let's get rid of our two lowest, which is a three and a one. And that means that actually we've got a decent control hand here of knowing that we've got the Black Joker, we've got a 12 and we've got a moderate and a weak there. But it also means we've got four low cards that have already been discarded, meaning that we know we're not going to be flipping those unless we get to the end of our deck mid-turn, then we just have to shuffle everything back in together. We would resolve any effects that need to be resolved, there are none, and then we generate any pass tokens, but again, there are no pass tokens we need to worry about because everyone is on a full cohort. However, you may remember that I mentioned we're going to start using abilities, and the mercenaries of the outcasts have a really, really cool ability, which is called Battle Tempo. 
Now, battle tempo takes place in the start phase, and it says during the start phase, this model may push up to two inches in any direction, meaning the entirety of this force are able to get themselves moving before the opponent even has the opportunity to activate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip for the initiative of these two crews, and I'm going to do the battle tempo at the same time just to save time, and then we'll go to the first activation. So the initiative flip then. Let's see what we get. The Victorious flip their red joker. That's not bad at all, is it? And, ooh, not too bad from Perdita, flips a 12. Now, obviously, the Red Joker is pretty amazing. It's not going to be beatable, so it means the Victorias will have initiative for this turn, and I think for those ladies, they are going to choose to go first. So we'll do the battle tempo, and we'll go to the first activation of turn two, which will be the Outcasts. And here we are then for the first activation of turn two. We can see the battle tempo ability has allowed the Ronin and the Victorias to kind of move their way forward and get stuck in. So we're actually going to start off with Victoria Chambers, who's engaging Abuelo Ortega here. And we're going to see if we can show you some different aspects of this. Now, the Victorias have a lot of interesting rules that allow them to kind of mess around with their placement when they activate, such as their synchronized ability and their Sisters in Spirit, which kind of allows them to mess around with activation control. Now, we're not going to go too deep into this. We're going to start with the basics, which is we've got this very angry granny in front of us, and we could do with beating her up. So <laughs> Victoria Chambers is going to buy an attack on Abuela Ortega. Now, it's probably worth me showing you what the Victorias drew for this turn. Now, they drew a little bit better than their contemporaries, so they're pretty solid for this. And I'm going to show you a slightly different use of Soul Stones. So... Soulstone users are almost always your master and your henchmen, which are like your more attuned people who are able to use these artifacts of power. Now, some minions can use soulstones, but they have to have a specific ability called attuned. But as we know, this Victoria Chambers is a master. She's going to declare another enchanted katana attack on Abuela Ortega, but she knows full well Abuela's a crafty lady, so she's going to spend one of her soulstones to give herself a positive to this flip, meaning that she'll be flipping two cards and picking at the highest, which is a really good way of kind of utilizing some of the benefits of maybe your concentrate action without the full benefits of, you know, getting the damage as well. It's really handy in a pinch if you really need to get that positive off. So Victoria is a stat seven versus Abuela's defense of four. Victoria flips a seven and a four. It's not bad, but it's not great. Abuela is gonna flip Ooh, a 13. So Abuela is currently leading this with her defensive four on 17. Victoria is on a stat of 14. But fortunately, we do have some cards in hand that we can cheat with. So I think Victoria is going to cheat in to a 19. Now, you'll notice this is actually quite convenient. She's flipped some tomes here, and this is where the suits are going to come in. Now, each card in Malifaux has a suit. And the reason for that is it applies to something called triggers. Now, obviously, I said the red joker counts as every suit. The black joker counts as no suit. Everything else is either, as we said at the start, a tome, a mask, a crow, or a... What's the other one going to be? I can't even remember now. A ram. And this will allow you to unlock certain abilities through triggers. So... Victoria is currently succeeding because her stat of 19 is better than uh, Abuela's stat of 17. And if we look at the options underneath, now, as long as you have one of these symbols in your final jewel total, you're usually able to declare a trigger. Now, you have to check on the trigger's timing because some of them will say after you've killed an enemy model or after you are resolving an action. Pretty much all of them have a different timing that you will need to take into account. Now, if it doesn't state a timing, then it basically means after succeeding. So you have to be successful on your attack, or there are defensive triggers where you have to be successful on your defense. And you can see the tome icon for Victoria is called Bloody Fate. So after she resolves this, after she succeeded, she will draw a card, and if the target wasn't killed, she will then discard a card. So let's do our damage flip first. Let's start really straightforward. So difference of two means Victoria is on a negative flip here. So she's gonna flip two cards and pick the lowest. However, Abuela Ortega has a really cool ability, which would have helped her last turn if we were playing them, called Hard to Wound, which says damage flips against her suffer a negative. So Victoria will go from a negative flip to a double negative, meaning she'll be flipping three cards and picking the lowest. So let's see what she's going to flip. She flips a weak, a moderate, and a moderate. So we will have to take her weak damage off too. 
Now, fortunately for Victoria, her weak damage is still incredibly hefty at three, and Abuela was only sitting on one wound, so that will, unfortunately, kill our lovely shotgun-wielding granny. Now, we'll talk about killing in a second. What we'll do is we'll take our after-succeeding trigger, which was to draw a card, so we draw this six, and it says, if the target was not killed, discard a card. We don't need to, because we have killed Abuela. Now, when you get a kill in Malifaux, if you are a living, a beast, or an undead model, you drop something called a corpse token. And this is dropped by the player that was controlling the model that was died, so Abuela's going to drop her lovely, beautiful corpse there. If you're a construct or a machine, you drop something called a scrap marker. And these are useful, and these are important for you to have these tokens, because actually some crews rely on utilising corpses and scrap for their own benefits. Now... Victoria Chambers has secured a kill, and this is where the abilities part of the cards really comes in, because Victoria, both of them, and Vanessa have an ability called Into the Fray. After this model kills an enemy model, all friendly models with this ability heal too. So actually, as we know, this Victoria here took two wounds last turn, but all of them will heal two HP. Now, you can't go above your health limit, so anything that would take you above that is just ignored, but it means that she's managed to heal her sister by butchering an old lady, which is a little bit awkward when you think about it, but we'll go with it. Second AP, then, of this master, second action, she is going to probably just walk. She doesn't want to go too far. She's just going to walk to this position here just to size up some of the enemies. Actually, she's going to go a little bit closer because she wants to stay within two inches of her twin, and that is so she can use her quick action, which is called the Setting Sun which is a two inch range and it says other Victoria Chambers only. This model and the target get shielded plus one. This is gonna introduce you to a new condition called shielded. Now what shielded allows you to do is when you take damage, you may reduce your shielded by one to reduce the damage by one. So it's a really handy ability to have. And then we've got one action point left for Victoria, even though she's been on an absolute rampage. Let's play it really simple. We're gonna put down another scheme marker to try and make sure we've secured the point for this turn. Now remember what I said about interacts? If you're creating a ski marker, putting it down, you have to be at least four inches away from another friendly one when you are doing this. And obviously, there's more than a four inch gap here. So that's a really successful first activation for the Vix. So it's not looking very good for the guild at the moment. Having lost Abuela straight away, they're a model down. So we need to worry about potentially this other Victoria turning up to cause trouble and put some damage in. So we're gonna go with the enslaved Nephilim, I think. Just a reminder, these are the cards that the guild have available to them in their hand. So, we haven't got any objective markers across over the board yet, so we need to try and get someone over the halfway line. I feel like Santiago and Perdita are going to be too busy doing some shooting, so we're going to try and use that frightening reminder we used last time on Papa Loco. So, as we said, you have to target another friendly model. There's a stat 5 needing a 10, so we need at least a 5 here. We get a six, fantastic. And you'll notice that we've got a tome as well. So the tome symbol has the preparations trigger on it. So we declare our trigger, which is going to be that the target also gains the focused condition, which is gonna be really, really handy for Papaloco because focused is really good for your attack actions as we showed last time. So we're gonna push Papaloco four inches. Even in his craziness, he's a little bit scared of the Nephilim and he's going to gain the focus condition. That's not going to be a bad start at all. Second thing we're going to do, I think with the Nephilim, we need to kind of tie up this Victoria here. We don't particularly want to be, you know, dealing with her charging any of our main people. So it's going to declare a charge action. So it has a move of four inches and a zero inch engagement range. So if we just put our ruler down, it can get into base to base. So it's going to push towards Victoria and then take a melee action. Now, this isn't the best one. It's only stat four versus Victoria's defense of six. We'll see how he does. He gets a nine currently, taking him up to 13. And Victoria gets an 11, comfortably winning at this stage. So this attack action will fail. However, like I said, the point of this is to just try and engage this Victoria. So we're just going to go for a second attack here and see if the Nephilim can do any better. We get... A 10 here, not too bad. And Victoria, oh, gets another 11. So that's another failed attack action so far. But the Nephilim has been successful in tying her up. Now, the Nephilim's abilities are pretty straightforward. It doesn't have anything particularly exciting for this one. However, when it ends its activation, it gets to trigger its Nefarious Pact ability on the front of its card, which says when it ends its activation, it may draw a card. So... He's going to draw a six, and that'll bring our total hand size a little bit too big. So we're going to discard this four, and we're improving things as we go. 
Okay, then we're going to go back to the outcast, and you may have noticed that Vanessa has gained a shielded, and that is because actually in the star phase, there's one ability I forgot to give her, which is her arcane shield. So she gains a point of shielded in the start phase of each turn just because she's such a good magic user, etc. Now we're going to use one of her main abilities to start here. It's called Intuition. It says at the start of this model's activation, it may look at the top three cards of its fate deck and then return them in any order. So she's going to look at the top three cards of her fate deck. I'll be honest with you, they're not amazing. Five, four, three. So they're going to go back down in that order. And she's going to try and attack Perdita now because I want to show off how defensive triggers can work and another use for Soulstone. So I'm going to use the Arcane Staff attack to attack Perdita. Now Perdita is in cover, she is within an inch of this, it's 12 inch range shooting attack, and it is targeting her defense. Now an interesting thing to point out is actually, if you're targeting a model in cover with a willpower attack, remember most of the attacks in this tutorial focus on defense, but you can attack willpower, they don't actually get the plus one bonus, it just puts the normal negative on the damage. However, this is going against Perdita's defense. This is a stat six attack but it'll go against Perdita's defense of six, which will go up to seven. So it's not gonna be great here for Vanessa. The other thing I'm gonna show you then, Perdita has a defensive trigger and it's called Quick Draw. And it states, if this action is a shooting action, i.e. the thing that's targeting her, the attacking model suffers two slash four slash five damage and this damage slip suffers a negative. Now it doesn't tell us anything about the timing. So it means that Perdita must succeed in beating Vanessa's action here, but we can spend a soul stone to add any suit that we want to the next flip. So because that defensive trigger says it has to be on her defense with a mask, I'm gonna spend a soul stone for Perdita to be able to add a mask to her next suit because she's a master so she can spend those abilities. So let's see how they do. Vanessa's gonna flip first. She gets a five, predictably. How about Perdita? She gets a three, that's not great. So Perdita currently with her defense of seven is on 10, whereas Vanessa with her stat of six is on 11. So Perdita is going to be the one who needs to cheat first. I think she is simply gonna cheat in her highest card that she has in her hand, which is a 12, which takes her up to 19. And as we said, Vanessa is only on 11. So that attack action from Vanessa will fail, but Perdita will declare her quick draw trigger, meaning that she may now do a two slash four slash five damage flip against Vanessa. Now the accuracy modifier still comes into play for these defensive triggers. We still have to know what the difference is. So Vanessa could have cheated here to make the accuracy modifier less, but because there is a difference of 19 to Vanessa's 11, this would be a straight flip on this damage, meaning Perdita could cheat it. But you'll notice the defensive trigger says this damage flip suffers a negative, and this is a way of kind of balancing this from being too horrendous in its damaging. So we'll get these cards out of the way. Perdita's gonna have a negative flip as she shoots Vanessa back because she's that good at her shooting. So we're gonna pick two cards and choose the lowest value. So we've got a moderate and a moderate. So the moderate stat value for this return shot it's four damage, which is incredibly tasty. Now, as we said, Vanessa has shielded. She's allowed to remove that to reduce that damage by one. So it will be three damage going to, to, through to Vanessa, which knocks her from eight all the way down to five, which made that quite a costly close combat attack. Uh, sorry, range attack even for Vanessa Chambers. She's still got an action left though, and she's unsure exactly what she could do. She could potentially heal herself or she might go get stuck into Papa Loco. But I think the most sensible thing for Vanessa to do is to try and heal herself. So she's gonna use that healing energy she left, used last turn. So that's six, needing a 12, so she wants a six here. She gets a four, it's not the best. So Vanessa is probably gonna to have to cheat something in. Luckily, she has a six of masks here. So there's no triggers for her to declare because it's on a tome for her to get a healing burst. But she will heal one, two, or three. So what do we flip? We flip. A week, that'll do. We don't need to cheat that, so that will heal her back up to six health, meaning she's only really taken two wounds from her activities. And that's Vanessa done. Okay, so we've seen the strength of the outcast. Let's see if we can show off the guild a little bit now. So we're gonna step up with Santiago Ortega, and he's gonna try and whittle down this Vic to try and get that first assassinate point for the scheme. Now he's gonna declare a shot at her, and usually this would be friendly fire, so it'd be a negative, but Santiago is such a good shot, he's an expert. And on the front of his card, it says, this model's attack actions ignore friendly fire, meaning that he is free to shoot at this Victoria Chambers that is tied up with the Nephilim here. 
So this is going to be his custom peace bringer attack, which is a stat six, which will target Victoria's defense. But the really cool thing about Santiago, if you look underneath the attack, it has a trigger on every single suit, meaning that whatever he flips, as long as he wins the duel, he's going to be able to do something cool. So Santiago is going to go first. He is going to flip a stat of six versus Victoria's defense. That takes him up to 17 with that 11. That's not bad. And Victoria oh, flips a one. That is not very good for Victoria. So currently there's a huge difference. There is 17 to seven, meaning that this would be a straight flip for Santiago. So Victoria is looking at this and she's going to cheat in from her hand a seven to take herself up to 13, meaning that this will be a negative flip for Santiago as he attacks. However, we do need to declare triggers before we make a damage flip. Victoria doesn't have anything cool on her defense like, you know, like Perdita does. But Santiago has flipped a ram, so he is going to declare the critical strike trigger, which says, when resolving, the target suffers plus one damage for each ram in the action's final duel total, up to a maximum of two. Now, you might be wondering, well, where would the second one come from? And that is because some models might have a ram built into their stat, or they might be a master who can stone for a ram to get the two. So anyway, this is going to be a negative flip on Santiago's part to try and see if he can damage Victoria. He's got a 245 damage track, so he gets a moderate. And another moderate, that's not bad at all. So this would be four damage, but because of the critical strike trigger, it goes up to five, which is going to be incredibly painful for Victoria at only eight health. So she has some options here. Let's get these cards out of the way. First things first, we've got five damage going through, so we know we can get rid of the shielded to knock it down to four. The next thing we're going to do is show you what else you can use soul stones for. So soul stone users can use a soul stone to reduce the damage that they are about to take. And what that means is they flip a card, which they cannot cheat, and it will reduce it by one, two, or three damage, depending on if it's weak, moderate, or severe. So currently she's reduced one with the shielding, so that four that went up to five has gone back down to four. She's then going to reduce it further by a week of one. So she will take three damage from this action. So it's still been pretty hefty, but it's not knocked her down to half health as Santiago was helping. But fortunately, Santiago has another AP. He's going to spend a second one. And what he's going to do is he's simply going to shoot into combat again, because why wouldn't you if you were Santiago? So again, we're going to go stat six versus Victoria's defense. Santiago flips a four. It's not the best. Victoria flips a 13, that's much better. And as we know, Santiago doesn't have particularly anything high in his hand to cheat in, so that attack action will fail, unfortunately, for him. That simply leaves a bonus action available, and I think Santiago is going to use his bonus action because you'll be able to see how you can get a little bit of control in this game. He's going to use the challenge ability. Now, challenge is interesting because it not only has a target number, it also has a resist stat, and it's going to target Victoria's willpower which is a little bit lower than her defense. So challenge is a quick action or a bonus action. It says until the end phase, when this model or when this model is killed, the target must discard a card to target any other model than this model with an action. So he could really affect Victoria's ability to deal with that Nephilim that's in base contact with her. So he's going to try and target her. So these stats, stat six versus Victoria's defense, but Santiago not only needs to win the duel, but he needs to get to his TN of 13. So he needs a seven and he needs to beat Victorious. So we'll see what he gets with his stat of six. Oh, it's not bad at all with an 11. Victoria, with her stat of five, can only use a moderate here. Now, so Santiago is on a stat of 17, which is going against Victoria's measly stat of 14. So she needs to think very carefully here about whether to cheat, and I think she is, so she doesn't have to get drained. So she's gonna cheat in her 13 to go to 18, which means that Santiago's challenge has failed. But a lot of this game is about card drain, and this is what Santiago is succeeding in doing. The last thing we're going to do is something that is unique to the family. On the front of their cards, they have an ability called Aporel, which says after this model ends its activation, which Santiago will be doing, another friendly family model within a six inch aura, that's the colored in symbol of a person, with cost equal to or less, can discard a card to take an action. So Santiago is stood just within six inches of Papaloco. So he's gonna have Papaloco discard a card, I'm gonna discard this six that I had in my hand, 
to take an action. And Papaloco, quite simply, is going to take the interact action to place a guild scheme market in base contact with himself. But that shows how handy these family members are, that they can support each other even when it's not their activations. So let's show you something a little bit different now. We're going to show you how Demise abilities work. So Victoria Chambers is going to go the leader variant. She's also going to use the bonus action, the setting sun. So other friendly Victoria Chambers only, this model on the target gains shielded plus one. And because shielded is a condition that can go more than once, we get to put two on this Victoria. Now shielding does go away at the end of the turn, but it just allows a little bit of extra protection. So we have this really annoying Nephilim in the way, so let's deal with it. Victoria Chambers is going to declare an attack against this enslaved Nephilim. It's going to be a stat 7 versus the Nephilim's defence. It's not going to be the best of options for it. Victoria is going to flip a 13. She goes big money and the Nephilim gets a 10. So a total of 14 to Victoria's 20. And I think the Nephilim is probably going to accept its fate here. So the crow does nothing for Victoria. She can't declare any triggers and neither can the Nephilim. So she is going to just make a straight flip for her damage and it is going to be a moderate. So the moderate would be four damage normally. The enslaved Nephilim only has three health. So she is going to absolutely butcher it and kill it. Now, interestingly, the Nephilim has an ability called Black Blood, and you'll find the Neverborn Nephilim can do this as well. Black Blood says, after this model suffers damage from an action or a trigger, every model within an inch pulse of it can suffer one damage. And Victoria would be suffering the damage, which is just as well why she put this shielded on herself to ensure that that damage doesn't hurt her any more than it should do, because, you know, she doesn't want to be whittling her health down anymore. The Nephilim is removed, it's a dead boy. It has an interesting ability though called Demise. Now Demise triggers when a model is killed and the Nephilim's one is really simple. It's quite a common one, it's called Demise Expendable, meaning that when it dies, its controller may draw a card. So for Perdita's crew, they have just drawn this four to take their hand up. So sometimes even your worst models at least can give some level of benefit. But for Victoria, the main thing is that it's cleared the path. Also, we need to remember that she has the Into the Fray ability, meaning that after she kills a model, both her, the other Victoria, and Vanessa can all heal 2 HP. And this is really handy at keeping them alive because Victoria will go up to 7 health. But if you remember, Vanessa is also 2 damage down on 6, so she will actually go back up to full health. So killing things for the Vix is their second nature, but it also shows how they can keep themselves alive. Second thing Victoria is going to do for her second action point, well, we don't need to do much scheming, but we can do a fair bit of sticking ourselves in combat. So she's going to declare a charge, she's going to push up to a move, and she's going to attack Santiago Ortega with her katana. So this is a stat 7 versus Santiago's defense of 5. So see if she can get revenge for the shots. Ugh, Vic flips a 1. Santiago flips an 11, of course he does. So... Santiago is on a total of 16 and Victoria only has a 5 to cheat with so that attack action will fail. She's got one soul stone left so she could potentially use this soul stone to try and give herself a positive flip on the next action but I think she wants to keep hold of it just in case there's bad cards so she's just going to flip again and try and see if she can do another attack. So this is stat 7 versus Santiago's defense. She flips oh, a 3 and Santiago flips a 2. So at the moment, Santiago is losing this duel. And if we remember, he doesn't have the best cards in his hands. So Santiago is going to cheat a six to go to 11. And Victoria, looking at this, thinks she needs to get some damage off. So she is going to cheat in her last card, a five. Bear in mind, she's stat seven to take herself to 12. So that will mean that she is on a negative flip against Santiago to try and damage him. Now... Victoria cheating in the five does have the bloody fate trigger, meaning that she can draw a card and if the target wasn't killed, she will then discard a card. So we'll see how she does on this negative flip for her damage. She gets a week and a week. She's getting all these weeks, which would be three damage going through to Santiago, which knocks him down to five health. Bit of revenge there for her. And then unfortunately, she'll just draw a card, but she'll have to discard it because she has nothing left in her hand. So you can choose whether or not you want to declare the triggers. It depends on what you think is best. For Victoria, she seems to be on a run of weeks there, so it doesn't hurt getting through the deck. 
to try and see if we can get to some of the nicer cards that are underneath. But there you got to see what Demise abilities do. So we've seen some big activations so far. Let's see if Perdita can match it as a master. So Perdita is particularly good at shooting models that are at full health, and that's because she has an ability on the front of her card, which are called Cut Down to Size. When targeting models with maximum health, this model's attack actions receive a positive to their damage flip. So she's really good at kind of reducing the health pulls of her enemies. So Petita's gonna go, and the first thing she's gonna use is her quick action, which is a really interesting one called Hero's Gamble. It says, discard this model's control hands. If you remember, she had the Black Joker and a four. It says then, draw a number of cards equal to the number of cards discarded by this action. So she's gonna draw a 10 and an eight. And it says, if there are any more enemy models in play than friendly models, draw additional cards equal to the difference. So even though the guild are two models down, they can draw two more cards. And you can see Perdita has dramatically changed her fortunes by drawing those cards. So next thing she's going to do is she's going to declare an attack action. And she's going to go for Vanessa Chambers because obviously a bit of revenge shooting on shooting here, which seems like the most sensible thing for her to do. Now... Perdita is going to make use of her very last soul stone. And what she's going to do with this soul stone is she's going to put a mask on her next flip because she wants her quick reflexes trigger. And I'll show you what that does in a second. So she's going to go with her custom peace bringer attack. It is a stat of seven over a 12 inch range. Obviously there's nothing blocking Vanessa here in terms of cover. So Vanessa's defense is a mighty five and we will see how she does. So Vanessa flips an 11. Not too bad at all. Perdita, on the other hand, flips a five. So currently, Perdita is losing. However, we know Vanessa has nothing to cheat with. So Vanessa's total of 16 will say exactly how it is. So Perdita is going to cheat in a probably a 12 here, just to make sure that this goes off. So Perdita will go up to 19 for her attack action. Now, this would normally be, as we know, a negative flip because the difference is less than five. But because Vanessa is at full health, Perdita has the ability now to add a positive to this damage flip. So it means it goes from a negative to a straight flip. So let's see how she does. She flips the red joker. Oh, that's going to be absolutely deadly. So the red joker is severe damage plus one. So that would be five up to six damage on Vanessa Chambers. Bearing in mind, Perdita has also declared before she makes that flip that she will be using her quick reflexes trigger as well. So six damage knocks Vanessa down to two health. I'm sure she feels great about that. But Perdita now gets to make use of her quick reflexes trigger, which is to take this action again targeting a different model, which is what makes Perdita so very, very good when she does this. So Perdita is going to shoot again. She's going to choose to shoot at this Victoria Chambers. And again, as you might expect, Perdita has the expert shot ability so she can ignore friendly fire. Now this Victoria isn't at full health, so she's not going to get the positive on the damage flip, but we'll see how she does. This is a stat seven versus Victoria's defense of six. So Perdita flips a one. Victoria flips, oh, a 12, that's not bad at all. So Victoria is on a grand total of 18 with her defense of six. So what Perdita is going to do is she is going to cheat in a 13 here to go to 20. Now, there's a really important thing to say here. If Perdita would have flipped a tome or a mask, she would not be able to declare a trigger a second time. You cannot declare a trigger off another trigger. It has to be a separate attack action, if that makes sense. But this doesn't matter because she's flipped a crow. So currently, difference of 20 to 18. So this will be a negative flip for Perdita. We know she's seen her red joker, so she's not going to benefit from this. But we'll see how she does against Victoria. So we pick two cards and go the lowest. So we get a moderate and we get a severe. So the moderate is a mighty four damage there. And I think Victoria really needs to think about whether she wants to absorb this damage or to take the soul stone away to reduce it. But there's one more thing I want to show you with soul stone. So Victoria at the moment is just going to take that four damage, which puts her down to three health, which is not great at all. And bear in mind, this is just Perdita's first action point. This is how deadly she is when she gets shooting. So 
Second action point of Perdita. She's going to shoot Vanessa Chambers again because that seems like a sensible thing to do. So she is going to shoot at Vanessa and we're going to see what happens. So Perdita with a stat of seven, flips a five. Vanessa with a defense of five, flips an eight. So we've got 13 to 12 at the moment. And I think, yeah, Perdita's probably going to cheat again here because she wants her dead. So she's going to cheat in the eight of tomes. There's no triggers to declare here, but it just takes her to mental maths, 15 as opposed to Vanessa's 13. So Perdita will take the negative flip on the damage again to see if she can eliminate Vanessa. So two cards picking the lowest. We get a severe with Perdita on it and we get a weak. Now, luckily, a weak for Perdita is two damage, which will be enough to kill Vanessa. So we'll place down our corpse marker and Vanessa is removed, which was an absolutely brutal action from Perdita. Now we didn't declare any triggers. That's the second action point all done, but you can see Perdita's already trying to see if she can get herself stuck in. So the last thing Perdita's gonna do with her action point, she's gonna shoot the Ronin. The Ronin's been annoying her all game, so we'll see what she can get away with here. So she's gonna use her stat seven attack against the Ronin. It is in cover, so it will get, we'll get plus one to its defense. So its defense of five will go up to six. So let's see how we do with Perdita's stat seven custom peace bringer. She flips an 11, that's not too bad. And the Ronin flips a 10. So the Ronin is up to 16, uh, whereas Perdita is up to 18 with her stat seven. So again, it's a crow, so no triggers to declare. So we just do the damage flip. So. Lots of interesting things happen here. So it would start at a negative flip because the damage, uh, the difference was less than five. Perdita gains a positive flip, which would take it to a straight flip because she's attacking a model with full health. But if you remember the Ronin is in cover and that puts a negative. So it's a negative flip net total. And we flip a moderate and a weak. So the Ronin will suffer two damage here, knocking it from six down to four. And that is going to be it for Perdita's activation. However, you may remember that they have the amazing ability Aporel, which is a discarding of a card from your hand to have a model within six inches and line of sight be able to take an action. So she's going to discard a card and she's going to go, hey, Santiago, or Santiago even, why don't you attack that Victoria? Now, that's what Santiago is going to do. You might think it's weird because Santiago doesn't actually have a close combat attack, but on the front of his card, he has an ability called Gunfighter, which says that he can treat any of his shooting actions as having a range of one inch, which is really good. So he's going to declare an attack against Victoria. It's going to be using his stat of six versus her defense of six. So let's see how they do. Santiago flips an eight. Victoria flips a six. So Santiago is currently winning the duel. Now, Victoria is worried here because she's on three health and Santiago potentially has a two, four, five damage attack on this attack action. Now, Santiago does have a crow trigger, which is grudge, which means his target would gain adversary, which he is going to declare because he is winning at the moment. And adversary basically means any attacks get positives. But Victoria is going to show you the last use of a soul stone. She is going to use it to put Santiago's damage flip on a negative, which is the final thing you can do. So he's already on one negative flip. She's going to put him on a double negative flip, meaning that he's going to be flipping three cards and picking the lowest. And I think Victoria's logic here is basically the hope that he flips a weak, meaning there'll only be two damage rather than anything more beefy. So he flips. Ah, there it is straight away. A weak, a weak. And a moderate, so there's nothing really to worry about Victoria. So she takes two damage there and she will gain the adversary condition, which we'll put on in a sec. Right, so we've got a crazy man that's burning down on this Ronin here and I think it's gonna try and get out of the way and luckily it has abilities to do that. The Ronin are actually surprisingly speedy when you take advantage of their abilities because they have one that's called On The Move. At the start of this model's activation, it may move up to three inches ignoring other models and basically this Ronin is simply just gonna back up a little bit away from Papaloco because Papaloco is not within an inch of this terrain, especially when I knock it like that, meaning that it's not going to benefit any cover from the shooting and this just gets her out of range in case he tries to like charge. Now, you can't charge through terrain, you can walk over it, but just in case he were to walk and then charge is the main concern. So the Ronin's going to buy an attack. She's going to use her Collier Revolver and this is going to be a stat of five versus Papaloco's defense of five. So we'll see 
how they get on here. The Ronin flips a mighty. 12, that's not too bad at all. And Papaloco flips a seven. So grand total of 17, no, 15, 17, 17 for the Ronin. And Papaloco is on 12. So difference of five means it's gonna be a negative flip here. Let's see how they do. Ronin gets a moderate and a moderate. Tell you what, that's not bad at all. That's gonna be three damage to Papaloco which knocks him from his eight down to six. I think that was pretty good. Should we do it a second time? So the Ronin's going to attack again. It's going to flip. Oh, a four. Not as good this time. Papaloco flips. A one. It's still good enough for the Ronin. Now it's got nothing on its masks uh, for triggers or anything like that. So again, it's going to be a negative flip difference here. Papaloco's total of six versus the Ronin's total of nine. So we'll see how it works now. Two cards in the lowest. We get a moderate and a weak. So a weak of two damage, which will knock Papaloco down to three health. Now, Papaloco has an interesting ability now. He has something called Grit, and you'll find lots of models have Grit. His is called Grit Hardened. While this model is at half of its maximum health or less, reduce all damage it suffers by plus one. Now that won't work for this action that takes him below, but for every future action now, it reduces damage by one. All right, let's, we're getting into the later turns. You're understanding how this works now. So let's go with the very definition of insanity. <laughs> Papa Loco is going to go. He's going to move himself five inches to here. And then he's going to declare a charge at this Ronin that hasn't activated yet. So he can get into base contact because he has zero inches on his melee. So Papa Loco's close combat attack is very interesting because it actually has a built-in ram to it, meaning that he adds a ram to his final suit totals no matter what. He's going to spend his focus to get a positive flip on both the flip and the damage if he's successful here. And we'll see how he does. So, stat five versus the Ronin's defense of five. Papa Loco flips. Oh, a 13. That's not bad. And a two, where the Ronin flips. Oh, a seven. So, the Ronin is on a grand total, I believe, of 12. And Papa Loco is on a grand total of 18. And he is going to declare. He got the ram anyway with the 13, but he's going to declare the dynamite punch trigger. When resolving, the target suffers, instead of its 1, 2, 3 damage, it suffers 3, 4, 6, and then Papaloco suffers 2 damage, which is going to be absolutely hilarious because, you know, Papaloco is an angry, crazy boy. So, this would be a straight flip, but because Papaloco focused, it's going to go to a positive flip, which means we flip 2 cards and we pick the highest. We get a moderate... And another moderate. So a moderate will be four damage to that poor Ronin, which knocks her from six all the way down to two. However, Papaloco would now suffer two damage from his attack. But if you remember, he has got grit hardened. So he, you know, he tanks a little bit the dynamite and he takes one damage instead of two, leaving him on a measly two health which i think the ronin can probably easily deal with in the next activation but for now pretty funny explosion okay so the final activation of this absolutely insane turn now after just getting absolutely smashed by papaloco the ronin is going to go she's going to use her on the move ability simply to move to here meaning that she is engaging papaloco but she's not being engaged by him just in case she wants to shoot next turn if this attack doesn't go her way. So it doesn't matter if you're engaging someone, it's only when you are engaged by someone that the problems start to come in. So the Ronin is gonna declare an attack. She is going to use her Dato against Papaloco's defense. So it's a stat five versus his defense of five. The Ronin flips a 10 and Papaloco flips a one. It's not great for Papaloco, is it? So stat of five on both of them. So Papaloco ends on a six, the Ronin ends on a 15 meaning that this will be a straight flip of 235 damage ignoring armor which Papaloco doesn't have any of but this will be important to try and see if she can get through that grit ability that he has so she could do with getting a moderate here with her straight flip just to make sure that Papaloco doesn't live through it she flips a week oh so two damage will go down to one meaning Papaloco is still on one health but luckily the Ronin has one action point left. So she's going to declare another attack and she's going to go against Papaloco's defense again. She flips. 
a 13. God, she really wants him dead. And Pabloko flips a uh, three. So 18 to eight, that is a difference of 10. This will be a straight flip on the damage. And the Ronin is to declare the reposition trigger, meaning that once this is done, she can move herself up to three inches, which is a really good trigger to have available. So straight flip for damage, Papaloko on one measly health. She flips a weak, so that would be two damage. It's reduced to one, but that is enough to kill Papaloko. But do not worry, Papaloko lives up to his name. He also has a demise ability, which is one of the best in the game. His demise ability is called Explosive 3. After this model is killed, models with a two inch pulse suffer three damage. This model does not drop any markers when he's killed. So of course he, of course he won't leave a corpse because he will just explode. So the Ronin's only on two health. So Papaloko here would pulse out three damage and that would be enough to kill her. Except the Ronin is super tough. She has an ability called hard to kill. When this model suffers damage, if it is at two or more health, which she was at the start, it may not be reduced below one health, meaning she just gets taken down to one wound. And this is a really common but really good ability that you'll see in the game, that models that are hard to kill, you need to actually knock them down to one wound and then do the finishing blow on them. So the Ronin has been successful in killing Papaloko, even though it's cost her pretty much all of her health, and she is simply going to make a move action just around the back of the tree here. And that is the second turn, all done. And here we are at the end of a brutal second turn there. We've seen a lot of people get whittled away. So in the end phase, we clear up any conditions that would go out the end phase, which are these two shielded and this adversary. And we check the victory points. So at the moment, we have got one guild marker down, but the outcast managed to get a second one down. So both teams will score a point of the strategy for getting a scheme marker down this turn. However, the guild have also managed to reduce the opposing leader, the ponytail Victoria, below half health. She's well below or one health. So they will also gain a point for the scheme of assassinate, meaning currently the score is two all, two apiece. Now for this final turn, I think you've pretty much got the hang of the mechanics now that you're ready to go. So I'm just gonna flip cards and we'll see what the final result will be. And if anything cool comes up, I can teach you any extra mechanics. So. Perdita and Santiago are quite substantially down compared to their opponents. So we'll go to the start phase of the next turn. They are going to generate two pass tokens here that they are able to use, but I don't think they're going to want to pass any activations at the risk of getting stabbed. They will also be able to discard any cards that they had, but nobody has got any cards left in their hands, which is going to shuffle our decks, draw a new hand of four cards each, and then flip for initiative. So I've drawn the hands already. Let's flip for initiative. The guild flip. A 13, that's not bad at all. And the outcasts flip an eight. And I think neither side particularly wants to cheat here. I think we're gonna go with the guild leading off for this final turn. And here we are for the third turn then. So you can see those tricksy outcasts have danced their way around the board thanks to their battle tempo. This victorious tried to get out of the way of Santiago, but I don't think it's gonna help him much against his gun. So it's worth me just showing you the hands that each side has drew. The guild have got a relatively nice spread of cards here, whereas the outcasts have drawn relatively okay. They're relatively happy because they've got the Black Joker, meaning that they know they can't flip that this turn, which is a really handy thing to be aware of. So Santiago Ortega is going to step up. He is going to declare an attack on this victory. He wants that second assassinate point if he can wipe her off the board by the end of the, day, the game. So it's good to declare attack. Start six versus Victoria's defense of six. He flips. Oh, the Red Joker, what a way to start. And she flips a seven. That's not too bad. But if you remember, if you flip the Red Joker on your opposed flip, your opponent cannot cheat. So Victoria is stuck at, what, 13 there? Whereas Santiago is on 20. And because he's flipped the Red Joker, he is able to declare any trigger that he wants. And I think he's going to go with the Family Values trigger, which is a really good one, which we'll talk about in a second. So this will be a straight flip for damage here against Victoria. I don't think she's very long for this world, but we'll just see in case anything weird happens here. Maybe a Black Joker. Oh, he flips the weak, which is only going to be two damage, but that is enough to kill the poor leader, Victoria Chamber. So she will drop a very pretty corpse as she is removed from the game. However, because the Victorias are twins, they have an interesting ability. This Victoria now triggers the Demise Unbalanced ability. So when a Victoria is killed, the other friendly Victoria, this one, 
heals three health and gets a positive to her defense and willpower jewels until the end of the game. So she's not taking any damage, but she is now on positive flips if someone tries to attack her, which is really good. She's very angry at the fact that her sister has been removed. Now, if you remember, Santiago did declare the trigger. He declared the family values trigger, which allows him to have a friendly model within a six inch aura of him. Draw a card to take the concentrate action. He's just going to ask Perdita to take the concentrate action so she gains a focus. Now, one thing I haven't shown you is actually these guys have a really cool ability called Bravado, which is when they take the concentrate action, they may push four inches towards an enemy that's in their line of sight. So Perdita is going to do exactly that because the cover runs parallel to her pushing four inches to here, meaning that she's going to be ready to start blasting, I think, as things go. So Santiago still has one action point left. So he is going to attempt to shoot this Ronin here by the tree, because I realized one other thing that I can show you is concealing terrain. Some terrain isn't solid, it's concealing. You can hide in it like dense fog or forests or fences. And actually, Santiago can draw a line of sight all the way through here to this model. However, if the line of sight passes concealing terrain, it imposes a negative on his flip. So he's gonna try and shoot this Ronin that's a one health, but his stat of six will be on a negative flip compared to the Ronin's defense of five that she will be able to cheat. But you never know, he might get lucky. So Santiago flips a five, not that lucky, and an eight. So negative for him on a five, and the Ronin flips a 12. So she is absolutely fine. She doesn't worry about that. But that just shows you how concealing terrain works, just in case it pops up, or you like using forests and fog and things like that. The last thing Santiago is going to do is he is going to try and challenge this Victoria to try and keep Perdita nice and safe. So we've seen this one before. It's gonna be a stat six versus her willpower. But if you remember, Victoria gets a positive to her willpower jewels because her sister has died. So her willpower five will be offset by the fact she's on a positive. So Santiago gets oh, a very high one. He gets uh, 12 there. Victoria gets, oh, not enough for her at the moment. So Santiago is currently sitting on an eight and Victoria is currently sitting on an 11. And even though she's got this 12 in her hand, cheating it would still make her lose the jewels. So this has been successful. It has reached the target number of 13 because we're on 18 for Santiago. So until the end phase or when Santiago is killed, this Victoria must discard a card to target any other model with an action, which is pretty good showing from Santiago. Right, over to the Ronin that's not very long for this world. And seeing that Perdita now has a focus on her, she could easily spend that to kind of offset the negative of the concealment and blast her away. So the Ronin's going to go. She's going to use her ability to be on the move at the start of the turn to move three inches. She's then going to move herself just into the corner here. And she's going to take the interact action now that she knows that she's four inches away from either of the other markers, just to drop a scheme marker there. And then perhaps the most morbid action, but it's, it's probably efficient. She's going to use her bonus action, which is called Final Sacrifice, which no flips are needed for this, just a, a solitary tier. This model may either draw two cards or add two soul stones to its crew's soul stone pool. Then this model is killed. So she is going to sacrifice her own life, poor Ronin, seeing as she was only on one health. And I think she's going to give the big boss lady two soul stones just in case she takes too much damage here. Okay, so Perdita could spend some pass tokens here to skip her go, but now that third marker is down, she's acutely aware that she's going to be priority target for the outcast. So she's going to get her shooting in now while she can. So she's going to declare an attack on this Ronin that's been pestering her all game. And she's going to drop her focus because we know the Ronin is in cover, meaning that its defense of five will go up to six. And Perdita wants to make sure that if she wins, she gets that positive flip on the damage to offset the negative of the cover. So Perdita will flip two cards with her stat seven. She gets a five and a one. It's not great. And the Ronin gets an eight. The Ronin is currently winning the duel, meaning I think Perdita's going to cheat. Perdita's going to cheat in her 11 to go to 18. But the Ronin is on defense six because it's in cover. So it's going to cheat in this 12. So they're both going to be on 18, meaning this would be a double negative flip. But because Perdita focused, it will just go to a single negative. So this will be two cards picking the lowest. No triggers to declare here because she flipped a crow. So a moderate and a weak. So the weak will be two damage that goes through to that Ronin, which leaves it on two health, which is a problem because if Perdita could have done more damage, knocked it down to one health, then she could have killed it with her second action. That's going to be a bit more tricky for her to do now. So 
Well, what can Perdita do about it? The next thing she's going to do is she's going to try and use her target practice ability. And this is a really good kind of like anti-scheme ability. So it has a range of 20 inches and it's a stat of six. And it says the target number of this action is equal to the distance in inches between this model and a target scheme marker. If you're successful, you remove the target. So she is going to try and shoot this scheme marker over here, which is nine inches away. So she's on a stat six with a TN of nine. So she only needs to flip a three here and she will be successful. She gets a four, isn't that convenient? So she just pure, like, you know, the cans in the old Western film shoots that marker away and it is gone, which means that Victoria is going to have to put it down if she wants to be able to get that point, which is a nuisance for kind of killing AP of the opponent, which is a really effective technique. Perdita still has one more action left. So what she is going to do is she is going to declare another shot at the Ronin, because why not? We'll see what happens here. So it's going to be a straight flip versus the Ronin. Stat of seven. Perdita gets a 10. The Ronin oh, gets a 12. So Perdita could cheat here, but she's not going to have anything high enough to be successful. That's pretty much her done and pretty much the guild done. So all she's going to do now is trigger her App or L ability. And she is going to discard this six to have Santiago take one more action for her. And I think what Santiago is going to do, he is just going to declare a charge to try and tie up this Victoria. So he's going to charge to there. Now, if you remember, his gun close, counts as a close combat attack. So... He's going to declare an attack on Victoria Chambers, who gets a positive flip to her defense because her sister is dead, sadly. So Santiago, with his stat of six, is going to flip a two. Victoria, with her stat of six on a positive flip, is going to flip a two as well and a seven. So she is currently on 13. Santiago's going to see if he can push the envelope. He's going to cheat to a 10 to take him to 16. And this is tricky for Victoria because she hasn't got anything good enough in her hand. So she's just going to have to take it. So this is a stat of 13 versus a stat of 16. So Santiago will win this duel and he will declare the critical strike trigger, meaning that he will be able to add one damage to this flip. So difference of less than five. So negative flip for Santiago. More importantly, he's just tying up Victoria. So we flip two cards, a severe... And a severe, of course it is, which would be six damage going through to Victoria, which is a heavy attack. But if you remember, that Ronin very kindly gave up some soul stones, so Victoria's going to spend one to see if she can reduce that damage. So she flips one card, which she can't cheat. She flips a moderate, so she reduces that five up to six by two. So she takes four damage, which puts her at half health. And that is the end of the guild's activations. So we have back-to-back -back activations now for the outcasts as they try and see if they can rack up enough points here. So we're going to go with our Ronin first, who has got her on-the-move ability to push three inches just to this position. She is going to then just walk herself over the halfway line just to here, and she is going to place her final scheme marker down, just replacing that one that Perdita selfishly blasted away. And we're going to round off with Victoria, and yeah, she's not had a good day, has she? Her sister's dead, her scheme marker's getting blasted. So she's going to take it out on Santiago, because why not? So she's going to use her stat 7 katana, she's going to spend that soul stone that the Ronin sacrificed her life for. She get a positive flip of stat 7 versus Santiago's defense of 5. So Santiago flips an 8, it's not bad. Victoria flips a 3, oh, and an 11, that's much better. So she ends with a total of 18 to Santiago's, what, 13-ish? So no triggers to declare here because it was a crow. So this would be a negative flip for Victoria, looking to see how much damage she can do. So she's going to flip two cards and go with the lowest here. So she flips, oh, a severe and a moderate. That will be four damage, which knocks Santiago down to one health. Like, he did not appreciate that. And I think, you know, if he didn't appreciate it, let's do it again. So this is going to be a straight flip this time because Victoria doesn't have any more stones to use. So she's going to use a Sat 7 Katana versus Santiago's defense. Victoria flips an 11. Santiago flips ooh, a 12. So Santiago ends on a, what, 17? 
Victoria is on a, what, 18, I think, there. Now, she could declare the mass trigger, which is this one counts as mine, or that one counts as mine. Another friendly mercenary may take an attack action targeting the same model, ignoring friendly fire. But, unfortunately, this Ronin can't see Santiago because they're both height 2, and there's this height 2 crate in the way blocking that line of sight. So it's just going to be a negative flip for damage from Victoria. She can't declare that trigger. Let's see how she does. She flips, or she wants him dead. She flips a severe and a moderate, which absolutely brutalizes the poor man, ends his life, and drops another corpse marker down here, which is, you know, a pretty good revenge for your sister being killed. It's not all of the revenge, though. I'm sure there's probably a little bit more that Victoria can, she can do. I wonder if she flips really well here, she could knock Perdita down, because Perdita is only on eight health. So let's go for it. Victoria's going to use her final action to declare a charge. She's got a six inch move, she's got a one inch melee range, so she's just going to go to there. And she's going to try and swing at Perdita and see how we do. So this is going to be a straight flip for both of these models here. And let's see how they do. Perdita, defense of six, flips a one. Victoria, attack of seven, flips a six. So, ooh, Perdita's going to have to cheat in this seven, which will take her to 13. Victoria is going to cheat in this seven to take her to 14. And this is going to be a negative flip for damage here. And this could potentially sway exactly what we need to try and get the final points to make sure that we hammer home an outcast victory. Let's hope for no Black Joker, though. Well, we know we haven't got it because it's in our hand. So negative flip. Moderate and oh, moderate. That's four damage on Perdita which knocks her down to four health and will finish off the game in bloody fashion. And here we are at the end of the game. And I think there's more corpse markers than anything else now. That was a hell of a bloody demo game for you. But we'll be able to tot up the final scores with only three models left on the board. So the outcasts were successful in getting down their third scheme markers. So they scored the strategy for the third time and they were able to get Perdita down to half health so they can use the reveal part of the assassinate scheme, which means they are on a total of four points. The guild, on the other hand, already had their token down for one. However, they had scored their assassinate for the first part, but they were able to get the other Victoria off the board, meaning that turn they earned one more point and finishes them on three. So in today's battle, the outcasts have emerged victorious, and that will bring us to an end of this demo. Uh, well, hard-fought victory for the Victorias then and the Outcast. Now, what a game, and hopefully that has given you some semblance of how this game functions and how it works. As I said, the app and the rulebook are available for free online. I'll also chuck in some links that will assist you with your learning further. But the main port of call that you can now go to is our battle reports for Malifaux, which are designed in the same way and edited in the same way, but they use that prior knowledge and will explain to you how specific crews work. Now, if you're looking to find a crew that fits your playstyle, can I direct you to our Malifaux Masters series of videos, which are short 10 to 15 minute videos that give you a breakdown of each keyword, how they play, and example lists, so you can find something that fits your playstyle. If you want something a little bit more detailed, let me point you towards the Harlefo podcast that we also host, which you can find on your desired podcasting platform, which has longer episodes where we talk about the strategies and the breakdowns of each keyword, as well as how to use those models. If you have any questions about rural interactions or anything that I can help with, please feel free to use the description below. And remember, there are also really helpful people that you can find on Facebook, on the forums, or even in your local community. I hope this has been really useful for you. If you do like the video content that comes from this channel, please do drop us a subscription and let me know what you'd like to see in the future. Take care, folks. Hi guys, thank you very much for watching our content. It means the world to us. If you'd like to see some more videos, they should be over here. And if you'd like to support our channel, keep these lights on. You can find links to our Patreon and merchandise in the description below. See you later.